The Gold Coast Airport services Byron Bay to the south and the tourist draw cards of southeast Queensland. It's lost most of the flights that made it one of the nation's busiest hubs. Well, this is an airport you'd normally see 18,000 passengers a day in. Uh, today, it's empty. It's been really hard to adjust to when you consider that this used to be the sixth busiest airport in Australia, and, and, and now if we can get one or two flights a day, that's considered a busy day. Just follow me. For chauffeur Peter Pappas, the empty airport is a financial disaster. Among those 18,000 passengers a day, there was a healthy market of people hiring limousines for the drive to surfers' paradise. Our business gone literally to nothing, 98%. Everything's just dying at the moment. Since the border closure, there's nothing moving. Cars are sitting still and no one's working at the moment. Before COVID, Peter Pappas was operating two offices and a fleet of vehicles. Full-time drivers, roughly about six or seven, and then we had uh, probably another 20 contractors that we were giving work to. So that's all gone now. Now he can't even cover costs. We do get the job keeper, but it's not enough. It is not enough to sustain the, the business, the vehicles. There's banks to pay, there's mortgages, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. I've had another job for a little while uh, just to, to help pay the bills, but it's, yeah, it's come to an end as well at the moment. So this is where it's going to get interesting now. Basically, after this month, see what's going to happen, where we're at, and is it worth maintaining the business or sustaining the business? Look, there's another shop that closed now. There you go. He takes us through a near deserted surfers paradise. This is the main hub of surfers paradise. Look at these shops here. Their rent here is astronomical. How are they surviving? And on to a luxury hotel. Hi, welcome to the Sheraton Grand Mirage. Come on through. He's putting on a brave face. But for general manager Keith Massey, the situation is grim. Well, I mean, we're 80% off. We're 80% off uh, if you looked at uh, this month comparable to last year. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. And then if you look at today, for example, we're at 10%. Uh, typically, uh, this time of the year, we'd sort of be sitting at, uh, you know, 70 or 80. International clientele, and, uh, you know, the Victorians travel north during the winter, so we traditionally right now would be full of, uh, full of customers from Victoria. It's still busy on weekends and in school holidays, but today there seem to be more staff than guests. No one's been laid off. The workers are on JobKeeper. The Gold Coast is suffering. We need uh, the borders to open. It's been awful, horrendous. Across the continent, the border closures are having a different impact. Manjimup is a little over three hours south of Perth. It's home to some of the richest farmland in the west. So that over there could be picked now and could be marketed now, but somewhere... So we could start somewhere between the middle of September, going right through to March. Paul Omaday is the Shire president. His son grows avocados, a booming industry in WA which supplies nearly a third of the nation's crop. But there could be a shortage if they don't have enough seasonal workers for the harvest. We've got probably 50% of the state's potatoes and 50% of the state's apples as well. So that means that we just need workers. And when they run into each other, say in December, when you're thinning apples, starting to harvest potatoes, uh, and then har harvesting, or the harvest for avocados will be in full swing by then. We do need a lot of transit workers. There's just not enough backpackers in Australia at the moment. I think we're down about 60,000 from last year. At peak times, Manjimup needs about 1,000 workers. 
and most come from overseas on special visas. All around the nation, food growers are worried about a labour shortage in a horticulture industry worth nearly $12 billion. Nicole Giblet is a third generation apple grower in Manjima. The family orchards have operated here for 80 years. We've been part of the seasonal worker program pretty much since its inception, so for several years now, and they've just become an absolute cornerstone of our business and particularly in harvest. Because seasonal workers from overseas were shut out, many of the trees missed their winter pruning. That could mean a poor crop ahead and higher prices for consumers. It is in disarray and it will have impacts on the, the quality of our output for next season, but we'll just have to manage that as best we can and then pick up the pieces next year. The orchards supply thousands of tonnes of apples to the major supermarkets. See, these apples aren't good enough oh, really? to sell in the supermarkets. How could they not be good enough? With the new harvest season looming, most of the seasonal workers they need are still shut out. Absolutely a fairly dire situation, I'd say, in terms of having the sufficient numbers to cover all the, the produce items. So it can be backbreaking. It can be hard on your body. But, like... I think it's just you've got to have that attitude of, you know, I need to get a job done and you'd be prepared to work in any job. I mean, I have... Yasmin Gooch is one of a handful of backpackers staying at the Manjimup Hotel. She was one of hundreds stuck in the area by travel restrictions after COVID struck. When COVID hit, I was on a farm working and then we shut down. We completely, we were locked in. The town rallied providing accommodation and food to the stranded backpackers. The community support for those people was just totally above and beyond. I mean, goodbye to my diet, that I'm meant to be on. But yeah. So when you've got a community, that makes your life better and we'll put your arm around you and we'll look after you. It's just, you know, you, you can't fault it. You know, there is so much love in it. Now, Manjimup hopes its hospitality will encourage backpackers to return for the new harvest season and that somehow they can find even more workers. That is the whole everything we're here to do. They are everything. They're the work for the farmers. They're the income for us. They're the, lively, the, the, the life to the town. They're, you know, up until now, they've been a massive instrumental part in what happens in Manjimup. Nowhere is the COVID recession hitting harder than Melbourne. Its powerhouse economy virtually extinguished by a second wave and the toughest lockdown in the nation. And few places here are harder hit than Tarnit on the city fringe. It's one of the areas where mass immigration has driven demand for new housing, underpinning the economy. We were full of hopes and ambition, and uh, we had a plan in place. Huja Jatwani and Vikas Kumar bought a house in Tarnit after they arrived in Australia with their young children five years ago. It's my passion, and uh, from childhood, I want to be a professional hairdresser and beautician. I have been working in beauty industry from the last 15 years and uh, it was always uh, in my dream to have my own salon. In Tarnish, they made that dream come true. Me and my husband took personal loan to open a salon. Luckily we found a very good spot where we wanted it and uh, yeah, and then after that we planned it accordingly and, and, and it's going good if you look at her Facebook page or anything you can, from the reviews, you can, you can I make I 100 up. plus reviews, five star rating. Customers disappeared as soon as COVID hit. Even before lockdown, since March, my business was not, you know, it's really low. 
when the lockdown was lifted briefly, uh, we, we realized the business was not there. People were not coming in. The salon has been shut for the best part of six months, but the bills keep coming. They still have to pay rent, public liability insurance, work cover and superannuation for staff stood down on JobKeeper. That's the work cover. She's the one who gets more worried about every bill, of course. I also get worried when we see a new bill. But she some... hides some now. Yeah, I've, I've, I've stopped stuff. telling her yeah. that, OK, and now we have to pay this. This bill is overdue as well, and this bill is overdue as well. I was thinking to take another loan uh, to pay my, you know, expenses. But uh, last last week I got an email. My uh, my uh, I didn't get any loan now because I already have, you know, uh, uh, two loans on my head. So I don't know. The couple's home loan repayments were deferred for six months, but now the bank's written saying payment is due. Oh, well, worst case scenario would be we will lose our house, we'll lose our uh, shop. It is stressful. Uh, you can't always show it. Losing everything is not something that anybody, you know, would like to f feel like. It's really sad and stressful time because um, I can't explain you. <laughs> it's really sad time. Yeah. At a nearby community kitchen, the charity United Seeks is preparing meals for people in need. Today, it's vegetarian pasta. Director Govinda Singh says it's struggling to meet demand. When we started this kitchen in May, we used to cook like probably 150 to 200 meals a week. And uh, now we're cooking like roughly around 400 meals a week. So demand is increasing day by day. The Tarnit area is a virus hotspot. For months, recording the highest number of active cases in Victoria. The charity delivers to the vulnerable. The fresh ones are here, so the older ones to the side. So it's great because we can just give them a, a bit of a mixture of things. Um, okay, yeah. so That's a pasta that's a curry. Yeah, I'm going to get 60, so what about two, four, six? But the need is expanding from the elderly and the ill to those who've lost work and income. The small businesses, they're running out of money and uh, the people who are working in those retail industry and, um, they lost their jobs. International students who used to do casual work, they, they couldn't find a job, so they, these kind of people are struggling. Single parents who cannot send their kids to the kindergarten and they cannot work, so you know, these are the people who are struggling at this stage. About 11,000 workers in the district lost their jobs before the second wave of the virus and the harsher lockdown. Community workers are dropping off food packages to more and more people in financial distress. G'day. Hi, Chris. Good, good. I'll go get some more groceries for you. Okay. Thank you very much. Have a lovely day. You too. Chris Coggan was stood down from his job as a forklift driver in April, not long after his baby boy Matthew was diagnosed with epilepsy. Can you go on the slide? Yeah. yeah oh, well, they say it comes in free, so we're just waiting for the third thing to come along. So, <laughs> hopefully, yeah, no bad news. It would be better if it's good news. Come in. Hey. Rent takes up half Chris's JobKeeper hey. payment after tax. His partner, Juliana, is too afraid to seek a rent reduction from the landlord. Otherwise, if they said, oh, well, we have to move because we're going to sell the house because we can't pay, afford the mortgage, then what are we going to do? The family can't pay the power bills. At the moment, I can't put the money aside. So usually, like every week, we put aside, oh, this is for electricity, $50. And, oh, but I can't do it now. So I rang the company and I said, well, we are struggling, but we're still willing to pay. So that's why I don't get disconnected. And then we're not the only one. Out there, it's worse. 
my parents always said, well, because we are Christian, so it's always said, um, they said, well, don't worry about uh, what's gonna happen in the future. God never give you anything more than what you can deal with. On one estimate, two thirds of tenants in the area are now in rental stress. They don't have enough money to live on after paying for housing. And more than a third of home buyers are in the same position. Nationwide, half a million borrowers in financial trouble have deferred their loan repayments. That's nearly 10% of all housing loans. The deferred payments haven't gone away. The unpaid interest is just added to the mortgage. So when the loans fall due again, people will face higher repayments to make up the shortfall. And there are still hundreds of thousands of borrowers who simply can't pay their loans. When the debt relief ends, we will see a wave of defaults and forced sales. And there's a whole lot of new houses being built. With immigration stopped at the border, who's going to buy them?